uh, HM Online sessions, as this is a pre-recording of a conversation that happened earlier. Uh, but it's still a part of the HM Online sessions. We hope you're enjoying them, and I hope we hope you'll continue to engage with them throughout Thursday evening and the weekend. But this session is to explore one of the very exciting new developments in Marxist theory. It may be said that in the 21st century, one of the most important steps forward in Marxist theory has been its engagement with intersections and intersectional traditions, relational models, and conjunctures with other identitarian positions. And this creates all types of synergies, dialectics, and developments. Now, one of the most exciting and the most recent of those is transgender Marxism. And next year, next March, Pluto are publishing a book, and I have two editors with me, and they're go we're going to have a conversation about what transgender Marxism is, just as a, if you like, whetting your appetite to actually see the book out in March and to actually go and buy it. I've been lucky enough to see a little bit of what's in the collection, and it looks to me as if it's well worth engaging with. So uh, I'd like to introduce Jules Gleason and Elia O'Rourke. Would you like to introduce yourselves, say who you are? Um, sure, so I'm a communist from London. I'm currently based in Vienna in Austria. And I have uh, published and organized a fair different, a fair few kind of theoretical and academic articles, um, as well as some discussion groups, uh, which uh, I, I would say the collection is sort of, um, sort of originating both from discussions um, we've uh, been hosting together and also conversations which we've encountered elsewhere online in zines and other things. So that's, that's who I am and maybe Ellie wants to go. Hi, I'm Ella Rook. I'm a economics editor for New Socialist magazine, uh, a longtime friend and collaborator with Jules, and uh, also another editor of the book. Uh, when I'm not doing gender theory, I generally work on political economy questions, uh, questions of finance, development, uh, but uh, that is me. Okay, well, let's make a start, and let's make a start with a very straightforward question. What is transgender Marxism? What's its genealogy, its roots, and its lineages? Where does it come from, and how was it formed? Okay, should I begin again, Emily? Well, I guess there's probably three, um, three primary uh, roots, if we're going to talk about genealogies. Um, and the first would be uh, feminism, gay liberation, or gender struggles more generally. So... Um, I, we would say a, like a good a good number of like the uh, movements and um, pieces of theory which aren't directly t related to transgender topics have nevertheless sort of um, found themselves um, kind of pushing these questions to their limits and um, yeah so I suppose firstly there's the sort of gender gender inquiry which is maybe not directly related to trans people. But has implications for it so that's sort of the first cluster of things the second is transgender studies which is this um academic field or a range of academic fields across various disciplines uh which has also sort of been substantiating and institutionalizing itself um over the past two decades especially i mean it's been around since before that but um one of the statistics we've got here is that uh transgender studies quarterly which is now the main um clearing house for this kind of material was founded in 2014, which when I read it was surprisingly recently. Um, so this kind of trans studies, which is um, specialized scholarly inquiry into trans people. And then thirdly, there is Marxism, which like obviously could spend all night defining and delineating and so on. Um, but one of the things we've talked about and maybe Ellie would like to go into this some more is that there is this, um, yeah, there is this specific growing trend, which we were kind of both encountering, especially by the early 2010s of like uh, different, um, I would say different people, primarily not scholars, um, often people who are neither sort of firmly rooted in any one political organization or in a conventional academic career as we would understand it. Um, but nevertheless, we're churning out material, perhaps published online, perhaps published in um, self-published uh, short essays and pieces of material or on social media accounts and so on. 
And um, yeah, certainly by the early 2010s, there was a good deal of this material. And somewhere along the way we developed, um, or um, we saw developed like uh, what you would call a fully fledged transgender Marxism. So maybe Ali can say some more about that. Yeah, I guess you see with the poem, the wake of the global financial crisis, you turn, so you return to sort of questions that Marxists were generally very good at answering in all sorts of fields of inquiry. Uh, particularly um, gender and sexuality. We also see a return to these questions. Lots of blowing the dust off old sort of archives, like you see a republication of Lisa Vogel's Marxism and the Oppression of Women, which was published in 1983, but largely ignored at the time and republished in 2013 and found quite a broad audience. Uh, it developed a sort of unitary theory of uh, the interlocking of capitalism, patriarchy, uh, racial oppression. Uh, then you see also like like a popular audience for stuff like Silvia Federici's <laughs> um, attempt at medieval history, which was like published in 2004, became really popular in the wake of that. Uh, stuff by like the convergence of social reproduction theory with particular Baptist Shire's collection, uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Rusa, Sue Ferguson, uh, Holly Lewis's really good book, uh, The Politics of Everybody, Peter Drucker's Warped, Gay Normality, and that Queer Anti-Capitalism, Patrick Leo's Marxism in Two Chinas. More recently, uh, the late Christopher Chitty's really uh, inspiring book, Sexual Hegemony, which kind of traces the development, the, the development across class cultures of same-sex intimacy uh, through the rise and fall of successive hegemonic cycles in sort of a region frame that you do in world systems theory. Uh, but then you have like a subterranean sort of uh, uh, contours of this where it's like most transgender Marxism was generally theorized outside of this circle as well it was the uh, more blog posts discord servers uh, YouTube uh, Twitter DMs medium posts all sorts of uh, generally excluded from the academy not really given a big representation within that but also responding to these sort of two trends and convergence questions uh, uh, like um, and we also saw the launch of journals like lies pinko invert Hominturn. Uh, so again and again, you see frameworks originating in like the loose and meticulous tradition of Marxism uh, being brought to bear on these questions around gender transition or how gender conformity can survive in capitalist context more generally. Like generally, it's been quite an inspiring and really interesting development. Jules? Yeah, so something I guess to say about this, um, a striking thing that we found is that um, a lot of them more specifically like gay communist or um, uh, trans, uh, trans Marxist theorization, like for instance, um, Invert and Harmonton and Pinko magazine, which are all um, examples which Ellie listed. I think each of those is maybe a year or 18 months old at this point. So, um, so I guess they'll have been for around two years or so when the book is released next May. But um, one of the things to mention is that um, that did seem to be the striking and maybe mutual non-engagement <clears throat> between um, sort of the Marxist, uh, like say, Tithi Bhattacharya's uh, collection, Cynthia Ruse's essay, um, Remarks on Gender, which I found very helpful, um, and a few other examples. There wasn't really, there wasn't really a dialogue. You wouldn't necessarily see um, that much citation either of those Marxist feminist authors, who each of those people are, um, and trans theory, and equally, you wouldn't see sort of an elaboration on this kind of Marxist feminist material um, by these these um, trans theorists we were encountering on, you know, Medium or Facebook or Twitter or wherever else. So one additional thing is that this is not actually um, uniformly true. So say, for instance, Holly Lewis's The Politics of Everybody, Peter Drucker's book, um, Christopher Chitty's book, I'm still working through, so get, I'll get back to you on that one. Um, but in these um, monographs, there was sort of inclusion and awareness of the overlapping categorization between inversion and transsexuality, between the kind of porous boundary of gender and sex. But, um, but nevertheless, like there still hasn't quite been to our satisfaction, this sort of, um, on the part of trans Marxist theorists, this is sort of this ongoing process. So this is one of the things we wanted to facilitate. And when we were commissioning essays, we um, took a view towards, um, including people who would both engage with sort of contemporary questions, but also these historical moments, which um, I think at this point, it's fair to say a fair few uh, cisgender Marxists, if we can call them that, have um, been doing a considerable amount of work um, 
working through so the Lewises, Sophie and Holly, Peter Drucker, and so on. I think there's a fair amount of um, of uh, but yeah, there's a fair amount of uh, trans responsive theorization there. But um, what we're looking to achieve is this kind of full integration where um, through putting together a collection which is exclusively uh, transgender identified Marxists and so on who've been thinking through these questions, hopefully the next stage can be a sort of fully, um, a fully sort of immersed dialogue between everyone in the field. Well, that's our optimistic expectation. We'll see if that, <laughs> we'll see if that happens. I mean, it's interesting that you raise the issue of dialogues between trans and Marxist feminist and other radical identity positions. Uh, when I was reading bits of your collection, which you were nice enough to furnish me with, I was also thinking of Rishi Wilkins, who is a really very much a favourite writer of mine. And I wonder mm. if you can say something about the main contributions transgender Marxism has to transgender identities and struggles. And then the critical gaze that transgender Marxism might have on Marxism more generally. Yeah, uh, so, you know, transgender Marxism kind of proudly sits in a long tradition of like elaborations and novel extensions of Marxist thought. You know, it's like since the original publication of Capital, debate has raged about how far going or adequate Marxist deconstruction of capitalist social forms is. Uh, sparked by a certain ambivalence in Marx's own project itself, both logical and historical. So while his intention was to historicize all of the social construction of all legal and social categories as matters of state, property, class domination, uh, to what extent is Marx's critique also a foreshortened one? How different would Marx's critique or account of the, the rosy dawn of industrial society have been if he had Liverpool rather than Manchester, his own in exile, or of his dispatches to the New York Daily Tribune on the convulsions of money markets on Lombard Street, uh, driven by disturbances on the continent, were instead dispatches to the Manchester Guardian about the travails of Wall Street, driven by tremors on the plantations and slave dealing markets of America's cotton frontier. Or if he had seen the employment of women in an industry and not as a recent and emasculating phenomena, but a, a general law of capitalist development emerging from the advance of factory system and mechanization, but a more complex and long term trend in uh, Britain's industrial social history where women were present throughout. Uh, or if he had seen that the dynamics uh, reshaping the transformation in industry and the world of work were also reshaping the other hidden abode, the, the private household in equally dramatic ways, or if he had focused his lens on not on, only on the relations within Lancashire's cotton mills but on the sugar plantations of Europe's colonies, Europe's tropical colonies. Uh, but so for our part, um, when we were beginning to work on the book, key to our agenda was like trying to get trans life itself into focus, bring it clearly into view. We were kind of opposed to any sort of entrenchment of this transcendental principle of trans that comes to obscure the particular struggles of different trans people in the face of capitalism. So yeah, when it comes to Marxist theory, trans studies, uh, and generally Marxist engagements with trans issues, we occupy a very altered space in social theory and Marxist politics. Uh, the main currents of Marxist feminism have largely done a disservice to trans identities, are uh, often gesturing towards trans people, then proceeding to write the sort of feminist theorizing they kind of wish to write anyway. <laughs> or for mm. example, uh, <laughs> Sylvia Federici's recent book, uh, were placed kind of alongside plastic surgery and surrogacy of examples of fiendish Catholic body modification practices that go too far. Yeah, well, one one particular to to draw on um, to draw on one monograph which is outside of uh, Marxism or Marxism proper, I should say, um, this book, The New Woman by Anna Amahini. Oh, I got the subtitle here: Literary Modernism, Queer Theory, and the Trans Feminine Allegory: The New Woman. Um, in this book by Emma Heaney, we have uh, this, uh, this notion of the allegorical drive, which um, appears in many um, cultural um, depictions of trans people, so especially trans women, trans feminine people. And um, we very much see this as extending into a lot of theorization, unfortunately, including um, a lot of Marxist work, where you have this um, mobilization of trans feminine experiences or um, narrative examples or whatever that um, trans feminine people 
uh, are kind of expected to serve a an instrumental role to define basically everyone everyone else's identity or everyone else's experience um, with the inevitable consequence that sort of trans trans feminine people or today trans women um, are prone to sort of uh, vanishing sort of in in their own right and this was kind of like one of our concerns and something we wanted to get past although um, as we sort of get into in our introduction, it's not exactly limited to the trans feminine experience. It's taking a broader view, it's something which many um, trans men and trans masculine people report as well. So we sort of wanted to um, sort of get, uh, get beyond this sort of utilization, um, this utilization of sort of the figure of trans feminine or, or trans, transgender people more generally and sort of um, attempt to sort of give this uh, yeah, to, to give this view of, of the kind of broader scope of, um, yeah, the broader scope of transgender experiences that actually exists within uh, capitalist states. So I think there's two points this could go in, but was there one thing you wanted to follow through with? I could have talked about social reproduction theory there, but maybe we can get back to that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what do you think, Ellie? Uh, Yes, yeah, so generally the allegorical move is generally taking trans experiences as some sort of liminal or ambiguous space uh, in the broader gender structure, one that kind of can shape us out of our existing society's complacency vis-a-vis -vis sex and gender. So it's a gender vanguardism of sorts. The upshot is that trans people are perhaps a useful source of recruits or a fashionable cause to follow and sotto voce bearers of a special responsibility. Uh, when Emma Heaney draws this out, she traces it through like sort of modern history and uh, modernist literature. And she looks at trans femininity in sexology, modernist fiction, social theory, uh, where we have examples of trans women as like these metaphorical figures for the destabilization of inherited gender traditions, stand-ins for broader destabilization brought about by urbanization, suffrage, women entering new folds in the workforce. And with that sort of our intended anxieties over masculine self-assurance and patriarchal rights. Or in other accounts, transgender experiences kind of serve as this a main example as the, of the dizzying achievements of techno scientific modernity uh, that seemingly demonstrates the boundless plasticity of plasticity of human bodies and their potential. Or even in Freud's hands, we appear at this sort of de theoretically degraded figure, never, which is nevertheless a critical allegory for the unconscious that clarifies his theory of same-sex desire as this inversion and castration anxiety. Here, sort of feminization, uh, willful feminization stands as this looming threat of egoic injury, but nevertheless clarifies the operation and universality of cis sex. Uh, yeah. so there's generally this sort of double bind. Uh, insofar as transgender women are seen to be speaking of her, herself, she's taken to be trafficking in mere particularity. She appears as a marginal concern of no wider import, easily corralled and siloed away. But insofar as she's speaking to a more general, more universal register, she effaces her very particularity as she is brought to bear on all topics of social weight. She instrumentalizes herself, trans as condition, as way of life, as mode of being, and is made to bear the, bear, bear the burden of the entire gendered order. So whatever she is, the trans woman is not always, always not herself, just a representation of gender trouble writ large. So not only must she offer a suspiciously received account for her gender, but yours as well. So we wanted to suggest like a break away from this usual way of approaching the matter. Uh, and it's, you know, once you see it, you see it everywhere. A more mm -hmm. thoroughgoing account of transgender life as it is lived from the inside and not merely as a supplement or afterthought to somebody else's theoretical story. Yeah. And finally, there's just one more addition to that, which is the question of oppression, because I feel like often there is this almost a sort of reduction I think in these conversations, definitely in um, Marxist casual conversation and definitely in progressive or would be emancipatory movements more generally, there's, there's always this concern that you isolate um, or you justify um, transgender theorization or transgender emancipation or transgender movements even on the basis that trans people have suffered a certain amount. They have these de developmental advantages, marginalization and so on. And this is kind of, um, uh, once this is sort of a necessary, it's necessary for people to appreciate um, to appreciate the particularities of of gender depression as trans people encounter it. But our hope is that we can move um, a little beyond that. So um, always as Marxists, like the concern is not only identifying an injustice or um, 
uh, like uh, making a moral appeal to to uh, to prove that we, we deserve a certain treatment or whatever. It's also to understand how we've already been integrated and already been plunged into um, the logic of capitalism, and sort of work, work out how we can how we can sort of shift ourselves from that towards a kind of more revolutionary moment. Because at once we do think this, this oppression and this suffering and so on is is a thing which defines our lives and does it every day. But also, it's not it's not really satisfying to either of us, and I think to anyone in the collection to sort of leave it leave it at that. Um, you see what I mean? So there's simultaneously this allegorical the allegorical move, and also the the, the appeal to immiseration, which I think, um, or the final thing about satisfying is it doesn't really capture the 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 joys and the thrills, or even the cravings and the longings, which um, which I've tend to found, and I think the rest of us have also tended to find actually are what um, define the substance of transgender life. Like, um, yeah, it's not simply, we're not simply doing everything in our lives to avoid um, murder or suicide, although that's um, probably an undue motivation a great deal of the time. So yeah, I think that kind of clarifies a bit about what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to get away from as well. I mean, I, I think that's a really, really good point to make because from the point of view of, of, of someone who's worked around sexuality a lot, uh, it seems to me often issues such as transgender are the addition to, or they're an extra concern, rather than actually changing the whole way we think about bodies, practices, sex. It's, oh, of course, we'll subsume gen transgender within our analysis, or we'll try to stretch our analysis rather than saying, our analysis has to change. You know, the, the, this this phenomena is a lived experience, a phenomenological experience which we have to engage with. And that, I suppose, brings me to a question about how transgender Marxism might address and respond to the more general critical debates around Marxism and identity politics, Marxist feminism and black Marxism. What contributions does it make there and what reflections does it give to areas where there are still tensions as well as synergies? Okay, should I start, Ali, or do you want to begin? Yeah, you go. Okay, so in terms of the collection itself, uh, the question of how it relates to the rest of um, Marxist feminism is something I've already touched upon, but I think maybe we should get a bit, a bit more clearly into that. So in terms of the collection itself, um, really the only description of what we've put together here is a polyphony, so a multi-voiced um, collection, because there's um, both in the style, the, the disciplines, the context, the materials coming out of, the national origins of the pieces, there's a pretty, there's a pretty wide array of answers to that question. So we have this kind of polyphonic approach, which I think is actually a significant um, shift away from our original intention. So this is out with one of the uh, best known left wing publishing house, um, Pluto. And originally the plan was that this was going to be a contribution, our contribution to Pluto uh, Press's um, social reproduction series. Uh, a bit of necessary context here is I'm primarily known as a, a social reproduction theorist. Uh, my handle on Twitter is social repro. So I think it's quite clear my um, personal commitments and my own sort of engagements and in the essays I've published, such as Transition and Abolition with Viewpoint Magazine, this was very much the orientation which I personally took. So the idea was we would find sort of like-minded um, uh, Marxist transfeminist theorists and they would all sort of give their own spin on social reproduction or SRT as it's sometimes known. And as we attempted to do this, we quickly realized that this would sort of be unduly constraining on the sorts of inquiries which our writers seem to be interested in. In fact, pretty much everyone we approached was initially saying, oh yeah, well, we can put an SRT orientation on this. But as we sort of put the essays all together, we kind of came to realize that there was a slightly um, arbitrary or a slightly contrived aspect to sort of yoking them all under the, this particular approach. Um, yeah, so we don't really think there's sort of one authoritative approach to Marx and to his legacy, um, nor indeed any one particular aspect, whether it's um, social reproduction or life making, or whether it's workplace ethnography and investigations of how trans people do or do not attempt to navigate the workforce. Um, and as such, we haven't really sought to impose one and sort of pin one thing onto this um, one framework. 
um, onto this collection. I'm sorry if I'm sounding a bit pluralist here, because like our, our view is sort of that Marxism is this, this broad and this living tradition with uh, these continual internal disputations um, and vying schools and sort of contested orthodoxies, um, which it, it's, uh, well, like it's fair to say that transgender people have been um, on all different sides of these struggles. So for instance, we've got um, Trotskyist contributors like left communists, Deleuzeans, like whatever um, division you care to name, we've sort of got different um, orientations and different positions within those um, sectarian struggles, uh, which we've kind of tried to, which we think have been there in trans theorization. And we've kind of done our best to reflect this within the collection itself. Maybe you want to pick up that, Ali. Yeah, I mean, generally have, you know, Marx, the proto-sociologist, beavering away in the British Library, looking over employment statistics, you know, we have that sort of stuff. We have uh, Marx the philosopher, who's interested in Aristotle and Epicurus, and the fever that writing German idealists who were trying to apprehend the sort of tangled relations of modernity, capitalism, colonialism, and the rival of mass politics. We have uh, sort of Marx the propagandist, this sort of dedicated organiser, passionate about national struggles and worker struggles and all sorts you might care to name. Uh, and who was, you know, busy at all this stuff. Uh, and we have all sorts of stuff that's animated by the uh, vicissitudes of trans life itself and trans communities itself, you know, from uh, a general fr generalized frustration with the mainstream of trans activism and NGO driven sort of communities where obviously there are massive internal class contradictions that you're not really supposed to talk about. Uh, which is generally stuff that we find is set aside in a lot of trans theorizing. Uh, we thought this might be a good way to avoid the sort of cynicism about this sort of uh, entanglement from slipping back into a sort of a burnout or withdrawal. Uh, but when it comes to, I guess, debates on identity thinking, identity politics, and their sort of so-called indissolubility of class, I think what we're contributing is that we don't really recognize accounts of Marxism that suggest Marx is indifferent to the messy sensuous of human affairs and bodily practices. Uh, if you read Capital, it's just such this dark literary text and people seem to think this is an addendum or just uh, something that you can kind of strip away, but no, it's the whole argument. It's just this rich layer, this Gothic building as Roman, uh, where, he's, where he's getting really deep in town. And like, as Nicole Pepperell notes, it's kind of like, this uh, dark parody of uh, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit where value is like, instead of uh, con self-consciousness, uh, consciousness attaining self-consciousness at the end of this sort of undialectical unfolding, we find at the end of the chain of simple commodities is us and our laborers all along. And that is the sort of way that Marx goes about it. It's really messy, it's really crazy. Uh, I really like this old passage from uh, early Marx. He's like, under the present system, if a crooked spine, twisted limbs, a one-sided development and strengthening of certain muscles makes you more capable of working, i.e. more productive, then your crooked spine, your twisted limbs, your one-sided muscular movement are a productive force. If your intellectual vacuity is more productive than your abundant intellectual activity, then your intellectual vacuity is a productive force. If the monotony of an occupation makes you better suited to the occupation, the monotony is a productive force. So there's this direct link between phenomenology, anthropology, and this just messy instantiation of bodily practices. And when you talk about the categories in capital, it's really like, you know, commodity, capital, money. They are all, you know, what in the modern lingo we might call performatives. And Marx's presentation of them is intensely parodic and deconstructive in intent and effect. He operates with this gaze of like a critical anthropologist bringing in one character after another, and after disassembling, disassembling their, uh, uh, their roles in reproducing an emergent assemblage called capitalism. Hmm. And just, uh, and, the, and in, in our reading of, of not only Marx, but the existing Marxist tradition, whether it's figures who are normally considered to be very kind of marginal, eccentric, heterodox, whatever you want to call it, um, like George Bataille, for instance, has these this, this remarkable essay where he compares Marx's, um, Marx's predecessors, anti-imperialists, uh, who opposed the authoritarianism of, um, of, of uh, 
of imperialism with a more purified form. So he talks about those as the eagle and then Marx's interest in, in his notebooks was the old mole, this kind of burrowing subterranean force, which is really about the, the hunger of the proletarian's belly, like reducing everything down to that um, sort of a thing um, through to more recent work. So I've talked a lot about Kirsten Sutherland in, in the panel the other day, so I won't go on about him, but he has this, this um, examination of this term galetta, like the gelatine um, paste of dead labor. So workers being reduced down to like a, a formless gloop by their, their working lives. And this is very much the kind of tradition of Marxism, which we're sort of uh, interested in, which we're drawing them from, and which I think um, it's fair to say our contributors sort of uh, pull from as well, this kind of notion of Marx where there's no real distinction between the viscerality of our experienced lives in the context of survival in, in capitalism and the kind of theorization which we're trying to do. So that's that's like that's where we're coming from, <laughs> I guess you could say. Okay. I mean clearly one of the challenges you face practically is COVID nineteen may well still be uh, a problem when it comes yeah. to the launch of the book. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to give a taster of the range of different essays. Let me kick off. I've looked at some of the essays, and there are three things I want to say about. First of all, you achieve accessibility. Whilst you're dealing with some very interesting and complex theoretical problems, and I think that's a real virtue. Secondly, you do genuinely have a range of different essays, not just in terms of disciplines, but approaches and forms. And thirdly, they're provocative. There will be things to disagree with and things to agree with. But what that does is bring a very rich collection together. So just to give you, uh, start you off with a couple of notes on things that really struck me. See, Rocco's essay uh, on Marx, he starts talking about organizing a Marxist reading group and ends up with a general discussion of organization. The CAACD dialogue, which I think the dialogue form is a lovely way of expressing you know, the, the way in which we, de we should debate, and it isn't used enough in collections. I thought J.N. Hodes' lovely title, Encounters in Lancaster, is just a beautiful piece of writing. And then it also actually takes you with the person in a narrative way, which both raises issues, but does so in a way that someone can almost shut their eyes and visualise it. And then there are perhaps the more traditional, this is a theoretical encounter, but they're always there for people to read, enjoy, and also think about. And, you know, I, I think all too often we spend an awful lot of time as intellectuals, academics, claiming to write for people, but not really. And this collection really achieves that. But I'll, I, I, and okay. I didn't mention your chapter because I didn't want to embarrass you. But, oh. you know, let, I'll let you talk a bit more about the collection. I, I really appreciate that um, that uh, pressy that uh, preview of of what you've read and um, with COVID we'll see we'll see what the situation is next spring we can only hope for the best and um, more realistically prepare for another round of Zoom conversations but this one's been quite delightful so um, concerning the essays which you raised I think the um, the the essay on um, by Alexis on starting uh, starting a trans circle. And um, yeah, and also this Deleuzian, Deleuzian dialogue um, contributed by a pseudonymous, um, uh, well, individual at least, or perhaps a collective. Um, this, this, uh, this pair of essays were really, um, as we were describing earlier, we wanted to sort of not be in denial about the way which this theorization takes shape. And we did want to break with the sort of ephemeral um, nature of it, because obviously it's in the nature of social media that this this writing is um, programmed to disappear. Like that's that's purposefully the nature of it. Um, even if it's not deleted by the user, it will vanish with the the waves of time um, in its own way. Um, so we wanted to break from the ephemerality, but we didn't want to lose the um, the means. We didn't want to really lose the kind of forms which this type of thinking was coming from. So those two essays were. Um, uh, yeah, covering the, the process of starting up the kind of reading group which would discuss this kind of material um, and then kind of capturing this dialogue um, were very much minded towards uh, that, um, that side of things. And um, yeah, I'm very happy that those, those two pieces are both in the collection. I'm very happy that you've foregrounded them as well. 
concerning this question of, of yeah, this, 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 this um, GN Ho piece. So Jay and Hoden and I have um, collaborated before and uh, we wrote our pieces quite independently of each other this time. In fact, my um, piece, which is uh, how, do trans how do gender transitions happen, um, was originally, I think, posted some time ago on the Pluto Press website or I've rewritten it for this collection. Um, I found it quite interesting that these two essays, which both deal with this question of encounters, so encounters and um, contact, which is another, another term, um, which uh, JN's pulling from earlier gay communist writing um, by Samuel Delaney. Uh, this question of how encounters um, form us is quite a big question um, for transgender people. And I think both of us are quite attuned and quite aware of questions of the state. So our previous collaboration was about um, trans healthcare and the NHS. So this is sort of what um, both of us have a big interest in, but it seems quite spontaneously, we sort of ended up taking the encounter and specifically the, the figure of Althusser, who's this sort of towering figure in all questions of aliatory exchanges. And we, we sort of oriented ourselves in quite different ways towards him. So I think that's one of the more kind of delightful features of the piece and one of the bits of collaborative um, work, which is in that, which I think, um, yeah, both, both those two pairs of essays, I think, show up what we were trying to do. There's this aspect of collaboration often between people who are not necessarily directly um, planning it out or communicating with each other on those questions. So maybe it's at least done. I think that's four of the essays, so we can... Four of the essays? Uh, should I talk about other ones then? Ones yeah, then? sure. Okay, uh, so we have... Uh, Michelle O'Brien. Michelle O'Brien, uh, she's the coordinator of the Trans Oral History Project in New York, uh, collecting the stories and experiences of a wide array of trans people into a more permanent archive. And she's written an essay called uh, Trans Work, uh, Gender Discipline, Employment, and oh, I forget it, it's Trans Work. Uh, and uh, she is influenced by the sort of questions that Alan Barube, who uh, won the Pulitzer Prize, didn't he, for coming out under fire about gay servicemen in World War II and how that shaped gay history. Uh, more like, and he's also had widely influential work on queer work. So why do queer people predominate in some jobs more than others? Those jobs that are often associated with the stereotype of one's opposite gender. So, you know, the sort of like blue collar labor for lesbian women and activities like cooking service, laundry and food service and flight attendants and cruise ships and fashion, hairdressing, theatre and entertainment, or, or gender with, uh, for women or uh, for men, or port stockers, sort of truckers, steel workers, that sort of thing. Uh, why is it, why is this, why is this an observable sociological phenomenon? What's going on here? Uh, and she's like, you know, generally she, they, he found that these sort of professions and industries where queer people, queer people could help each other get jobs, find some sort of space to express their non-normative genders at work, uh, reduce the risk of homophobic attack. And in some cases, they were actively favored by their employers uh, for all sorts of wide reasons. Uh, she picks up on his description of like a strike by uh, queer cruise ship line in workers. Uh, and it was like a communist party union that had affiliated and led this strike. And it was like, no queer baiting, no race baiting, no anti-communism and stuff like this. They raised it as their like union banner sort of, sort of uh, slogan. So a natural extension of these sort of inquiries is trans work. What are those sectors where trans people find themselves disproportionately represented relative to their population? And what is it about those sectors that make themselves accommodating to or exploit the skills of trans presentation, aesthetics, comportment and social life? So like, the sociological work, detailed sociological work. Uh, it's quite thin on the ground. National statistics for a variety of reasons and macro survey are also thin on the ground and macro surveys can only paint like a broad brush picture. So we know that trans people in the US are often unemployed and in unemployed for a long period of time. And even when they do find work, they generally live in poverty. But uh, Michelle draws on her experience with the oral history project to provide a sort of suggestive outline to some uh, of some of these queer work, trans work questions. Uh, she kind of traces those sectors where, you know, the people she interviewed where time and again, they seem to be showing up in these sectors more than others. So obviously tech and fashion and sex shops and sex works or AIDS, HIV treatment programs, 
the sort of this is the sort of fine grained labor and uh, queer trans labor sociology kind of makes a mockery of the claim that the abstract dynamics of capital accumulation are just wholly disinterested in the social distinctions of the people they employ that they exploit. And I think this is like a really important uh, work, piece of work and a really important contribution for more work about trans people, more, more work about where they work and work and how they get the by and who exploits them, who dominates them. And uh, kind of as a natural extension of this, uh, Kate Dolgriffiths has also wrote a piece about uh, trans work and, well, trans work and labor and gender freedom. Uh, and it could have been written in conversation with Michelle's really. Uh, she's fo they are focusing on recent debates on the US left over worker organizing and strategy, particularly arguments featured in Jacobin magazine over the democratic socialist of America and the struggle for these sort of universal demands like Medicare for all, as well as like Kim Moody's uh, idea of choke points in production in industrial manufacturing and his more recent extension of that idea in his book on new terrain to encapsulate even broader sectors uh, beyond the industrial shop floor towards choke points of social reproduction. So that education, caring and service labor on which society depends. If queer and trans people predominate in some industries more than others, if we're alienated from the family form in differing ways, if our struggle for healthcare is often unique and posed as a marginal concern by wider society, what does this suggest about organizing workers, workers who are in those choke points of social reproduction? And how has that played out historically? Uh, they use examples from South African freedom struggle, ACT UP, to make the point that the left is not only unusually tolerant of queers, but also, and trans people, it also consists of us. Uh, do you want to pick up some more? Um, maybe, maybe we can just sort of like, uh, I think we're probably not going to get through all that, all 18 to 20 essays at this rate, but um, but suffice it to say that we have this, um, as you can probably tell by this point already, we have this range of everyone. Um, um, yeah, we have a, a range of essays which either deal with uh, personal uh, experiences and personal encounters and um, autobiographical um, renderings. I'm actually blanking on the title of one of the best examples of that at the moment. But um, we also have sort of historical examinations like Nat Raha's piece, which is about some lesser known groups um, like Wages Do Lesbians, as well as some more familiar ones like the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, um, through to engagements with more, um, what we might call sort of, um, a, yeah, reappropriation of more mainstream uh, theories of development and socialization, um, such as Noah Zanus's essay, which sort of twins um, development theory and social reproduction to quite marvelous effect. Um, through to what we would call obviously more um, high theory and more marxologically informed works like Anya Heiss of Ice of Flowers, um, uh, excellent uh, essay, which uh, she developed out of a previous uh, talk for us at Historical Materialism for the Leftovers um, panel there. So there's really quite a um, broad sweep of um, approaches and different kind of material which we've put together. So. Possibly, um, possibly at this point, having I think given a fairly, <laughs> a fairly <laughs> thoroughgoing preview, maybe we can, um, yeah. Well, I think there's one, one sort of more thematic topic which was sort of guiding us, which Ali's done quite a lot of work on, and I've done quite a lot of work on in my own way. So maybe we should just move through to that. Or any other questions that you've got um, at this point are also welcome. <laughs> I think if you want to, I mean, the, the one other observation I'd make, which has just occurred to me, there is an unhealthy tendency within some branches of radical thinking. And I can imagine the people who are watching this, hopefully, are people who want to learn more about it. But there'll be people who also say, isn't it good that there's a transgender Marxism book and there's a transgender idea and it's another segment of Marxism? And I want to point to another essay to illustrate the point I want to make, which is this is obviously a collection about transgender, but it also sparks all types of ideas which are not directly engaged with transgender. Now, I write on, and I'm working at the moment, on both kink and on the intersection of age, sex, and disability. And Zoe Belinsky's essay, Transgender and Disabled Bodies Between Pain and the Imaginary, have made me think about rewriting sections of my work. So whilst 
it's right to focus on the transgender element. Anybody who thinks, well, this is just something we can put into a box and a segment is missing the point. There are some really lovely, fertile elements to this. And I think you've already demonstrated that when Ellie's been talking very much about retrieving these insights directly from Marx's political economy and Marx's writings. And I wouldn't want us to finish with people thinking, oh, that's the transgender talk. This is a talk about critical thinking, about lived experience, political struggles, and hopefully revolutionary action. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Zoe's essay is quite remarkable. She's primarily a um, phenomenologist by training. So she's got this really uh, remarkable insight into questions of disability, which is also, as probably comes across, something that she has dealt with personally um, throughout her life. So. There's this, um, as you say, this real combination of, um, yeah, there's this, I, I guess what, what is today is today primarily called in, in academic and movement circles like intersectionality, but I would say also um, in a way intersectionality is quite an intuitive um, approach for many transgender people because of course um, with everything from disabilities to long-term unemployment to um, HIV rates, you see uh, mental health, needless to say, um, you see this, this um, yeah, this, this huge predominance of any, any one of those things among transgender communities. So this is sort of by necessity something which anyone, um, yeah, anyone doing trans organizing will know plenty of sex workers, people living with HIV, um, people going through mental health crises and so on. It's um, definite intersectionality is certainly a matter of necessity. Um, for transgender theorists and transgender movement actors. So one final thing, this is related to your question very much. One um, uh, breakthrough for me, when you're talking about rewriting your own um, research, I definitely found this convergence in my own concerns and with the essays I'd already written, in fact, and already attempted to publish. Um, uh, a lot of my own theorization had sort of circled back to this question of the household, which, um, Ellie is also what has been for some years now, sort of working through um, with this notion of uh, the the economy, the economic with a OI, um, the the economic um, focus for political economy. So maybe this is the the final thing we would like to to cover or work through um, as one sort of concern, which you're going to find um, hopefully a lot of material to think through in this collection and. Did you want to go? For oh, me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, oh, yes. I, I kind of met my friend Angela Mitropoulos, who was a brilliant theorist uh, and who's like really, really thought this stuff over in a way that's not really been uh, more trumpeted more, which should be because it's a really great book and a body of work. Uh, so, capitalist society kind of turns on what Angela Mitropoulos has analyzed as the organization of a no economic and genealogical ordering. The nexus of race, gender, class, and sexuality of nation constituted through the premise of the proper productive household. Uh, so uh, here appeals to fundamental underlying fundamental value is more or less a euphemism for a more or less stable capitalist maturity. And this is premised on the persistence, or as in the case may be restoration of genealogical ties of composition and lines of inheritance, or more broadly on the orderly transmission and transfer of property debt and authority on over time. So this economic framing kind of operates as a critique of political economy and economic discourse and its limits in apprehending social reality, including Marx's attempts that hypostasize capitalist society at the point of production, the locus of the, 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 locus of the wage and the form of the wage. Uh, so, uh, so that sort of salto mortale, the aliter relief, cross contingency, necessary for valorization of capitalism, find its unavoidable foundations in the assertion, formalization, and contractualization of these genealogical ties of dependence and the norms, laws, conventions, epistemological claims, and moral philosophies that naturalize them, those social practices that serve to transform contingent possible futures into an inescapable deck book of the present. Uh, so when it comes to the household, uh, the uh, sexual difference and uh, transgender lives, to write a history of sexual differences to write a history of contracts. Those contracts may be entirely formal, but uh, informal, formal, or it may even barely register within conscious thought. They are forged with yourself, your family, your doctors, your, your school, your employers, and with the state. 
So here's one of the key claims of the book is that what other accounts of transgender lives have identified as the transition in epistemic regimes in the social, scientific and medical understanding of gender, we want to identify as the weighty historical corollary of a transition in property regime, working pattern, on wage labours, family structures and domestic life. Transition requires a rupture in all of these. We cannot settle for accounts of, of grasping how knowledge was organised and reorganised. We have to develop an account of why and to what ends transgender lives no more than any other and not always live for our own purposes or towards our own ends. Uh, um, yeah, for sure. Well, the yeah, because this 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 really the what we're talking about isn't really reducible. It isn't really reducible to sort of workplace situation or um, to um, uh, to situation relative to employers or anything like that. You simultaneously have to consider um, the workplace very broadly defined and also the household very broadly defined to get at the basics of transgender um, experiences. So if, um, yeah, so to try and like consider both of those things is really what our collection is trying to open up a means for. And this is actually something which we were definitely finding in the sort of more um, life-making type framing you find in a lot of social reproduction theory and now also in Angela's um, economics with an OI. Um, so, excuse me, I'm being distracted. So, um, so with regards to, um, so, uh, so that's kind of like the two, twofold approach of our basic theoretical thing. And with any luck, like anyone reading this collection is gonna find um, a fair amount of theoretical, like a theoretical flesh for the bone of those, um, those kind of key features of trans life. Um, was there anything more you had to say, Ali, on that one? Cause uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, the sort of oikonomia, the oikonomia critique. Uh, what was that? <laughs> it's just Apple being a pain. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I mean, like if you think about lots of contemporary social theory, like Polanyan analysis, Keynesian analysis, uh, um, neoliberal sort of analysis, there is always a return to the sort of a connection between the household, what is proper to the household and the nation state, uh, this nexus of the gender, race, class and borders in and of itself. And in an extension of Angela's work, we wanted to talk about sort of the medicalization of transgender people and how is that, you know, how is that an economic framing of things? It is an economic framing of things. Uh, so, you know, in medicalization organizes transgender possibility as defined by our interaction with medical science in the etiology of clinical life. Transsexuality is understood as deviation, excess or deficient from an otherwise desirable state of embodiment while possible to manage and mitigate. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's my point. Uh, so we see that the clinic as an economic institution, so where stewarding patient well-being is kind of a subordinate concern to the proprietarian interest of the state in administering and managing sexual difference itself. With clinics remit and operations are just this site of continual contestation between state clinics, clinicians, patients, and wider social attitudes between, on the one hand, gender difference as it actually lived, practiced, and experienced, and always on the other hand, the state and capital's attempts to organize and contract, constrain, and manage the effects of gender difference. As ever, the state <laughs> organizes a reliable pattern of commitments and obligations like domination and exploitation across space, time, and lines of inheritance. And it's for this reason that planet trans people find themselves not just in solid denial, but a highly conditional state validation. And it's to return to our theme of, you know, sexual differences in the history of contracts. Yeah, and one example of kind of what we're talking about here is say, for instance, in Britain at the moment, I've been following quite closely this big trans kids controversy, which is unfolding in, in Britain now as feminism continues to become dominated by uh, transphobic voices in, in um, uh, well, I should say Scotland and England. It, it doesn't seem to be across the entire uh, territory there, but it is um, definitely this, this British tendency, which is sort of getting out of control. But what I found so striking about this conversation as it relates to households is all of the trans kids controversies seems to center around both um, 
NHS state bodies and also NGOs, this one NGO, Mermaids in particular. And what each of these organizations is actually defined by is that they only service the slender, if slightly expanding, but the tiny minority of parents who are actually supportive of their transgender children. So we see in the, um, in the discourse, in the public discussions of things, um, discussions always seem to kind of circle back to this relatively fortunate um, population with accepting, accepting parents, which to me is very striking. And I think when we look at household struggles um, more generally and include um, the majority of transgender people who are rejected by one or more of their relatives, um, I think you'll start to see a pretty different picture. And that's the, that's the kind of thing we want to lead through into, because I think a lot of the discourse and a lot of the media coverage in particular, uh, political, mainstream, electoral, political discussion is very much focused on this, this um, tiny and sort of eccentric um, minority of the overall situation. And um, you really need a critical um, perspective with regards to the state. Um, uh, the state and its auxiliary affiliated NGO bodies, that is, um, uh, or inclusive of those. And that is kind of what we would like to re reorient uh, stuff towards. So simultaneously, a lot of, as, as Ali just said, a lot of us are um, seeking this conditional validation from state authorities. Yet on the other hand, many people are sort of not even in the running. You know what I mean? And this has a lot to do with questions of household and questions of other stuff to do with that. So. Um, I think that's about it for me, actually. Um, I'm pretty, okay. I'm pretty satisfied. We've made our point now. <laughs> okay, that's fine. And I think that last discussion was quite important because in the, about ten to fifteen minutes, you covered political economy, contract law, property, possession and dispossession, politics, medicine and health, state. It's an enormous breadth of areas. and childhood and childhood and childhood. <laughs> Uh, and it's an enormous breadth of areas uh, to actually extend an analysis in, integrate and give a different perspective. Just to, to wind it up then, uh, I'm glad we, you've agreed to have this session with us. Uh, so thank you very much. I think the book will be a very interesting book and challenging book for people to read and enjoy. And that's important as well, enjoy and then debate. But I also think what's exciting about this is not just the book itself, but the fact this is an emergent new strand of Marxist thinking uh, and people should really engage with it, both from the point of view of engaging with it and how we engage with our own analysis, for example, in relation to Marxism and sexuality. So thanks very much for that. Now, for those of you who are staying with us, uh, in about two and a half hours, we have our next panel, which is on Irrealism as Socialist Cultural Theory, and we hope you'll join us for that. Uh, I would reiterate the Sebastian uh, video from the beginning of this, uh, and it always makes me laugh, from the beginning of this <laughs> session, which is to actually think about subscribing to the journal, taking advantage of the sale on the books, but also, of course, on this occasion, we'll also allow Pluto to get something out of it as well, and I'd encourage you to buy the book next March. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, it's been a joy, Paul, and it was a joy putting together the collection as well. So yeah, yeah thank you. It was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Ciao. Subscribe to Historical Materialism Journal, buy books in the Historical Materialism book series, and get back to work.